Three more. Three more. All right, so I'm going to jump into it. So one of I'm going to go backwards. Okay. One of the most profound moments of my education was when I was in Rick Rubin's dorm room at NYU, and I saw him painting over the value of the gray against the magenta on the record sleep. And I was saying to myself, man, it just looks fucking good to me. One of the most powerful lessons to me is the attention to detail, to getting your art right. Manager, impresario, industry steward, Lior Cohen broke the defining artist of our time and then redefined the paradigm of the music business. This is his blueprint. What was Lior Cohen like in high school? Lior Cohen was a really happy person in a happy family and living in a little sleepy village called Los Feliz. My parents were like the epicenter of a lib very liberal hippie, potluck dinners, poetry readings, art shows, political rallies all happened in my house. Were your grades good in school? I've, I've always struggled at school. My, my dad is a psychiatrist, and he nominated me for being the first test of Ritalin, because I was a hyper kid. And because I'd come from Israel, I had trouble learning English, but I worked hard. You know, I tried to do the best I could. So you graduate from college and you start working for a bank. Mm -hmm. What were you doing? I was pushing paper. I was, you know, they called me a, like a financial analyst, but there was no analysis happening. Um, there was nothing for me to really do. It was a pretty miserable period of my life. So I was reading Bill Adler's biography of um, Run DMC from 87, mm -hmm. and when he introduces you, he mentions that after working in finance, you had worked as a crab fisherman. Was that, is that true? No, that's not, that's not true. So. My roommate in college was the grandson of the president of Ecuador. And the college that I went to had the best marine biology school. They were trying to create um, shrimp farms. And Ecuador was the main experiment. So, you know, one time my uh, roommate went back to college and he says, you know, my uncle loves shrimps so much, he dug a hole in his backyard, started growing shrimps. And then a year later, that hole is like four miles by four miles, and it's actually becoming a business. So I went to Ecuador and tried to um, check it out and, and learn about it. So your friends bring you into the music Fold. The story starts um, with you throwing a party in LA mm -hmm. with the Circle Jerks and Run yeah. MC. Mm -hmm. How is it that you're even figuring out who to book or how to get space or how, to, how any of that stuff works? It's not that heavy lifting. Uh, uh, how, how, <laughs> how you do it is you do it by trial and error and you just go get it done. I grew up with all the possibilities. There was no barrier of anything. Like, my parents taught me that everything you do matters. That I'm not small. That n none of us are small. We could affect change. Whether it's political change, cultural change, anything. So, to throw a show, um, to um, make that happen, 
didn't feel like heavy lifting. So you throw that first show, you, you invest $700, turn it into $30,000? Yeah. Your next show though, bombed. Just, just bombs. Like bombed. What, what did you learn about sort of the nuance of hip hop from that? What happens to a dude that um, invested $700, May 36, what do you think happens? Spends that money and then bow, you catch a brick and then, you know, whoa, you're walking around numb. So you went from, you know, high elation and um, thinking that you're on the top of the world to really a devastating feeling. In fact, that feeling still lives inside of me that I could feel right now. Like right this second, I could feel that, that, that pain that I went through when I recognized, wow, it's fragile. A lot of people would have walked away at that point, but you sort of doubled down and not only continued in the music industry, but ended up uprooting your entire life and moving to mm -hmm. New York. Mm -hmm. How did you sort of rationalize that? Was that in response to the challenge? I did something wrong and I wanted to, you know, reload and get it right. I wanted to understand what was, what happened that I got it so horribly wrong. So you, you get to New York, and by virtue of having a passport when no one else in the office does, yeah. you, you end up going on the road with Run DMC. Yes. What were the most crucial things to the success at Rush for you? Um, flexibility, preparedness, thoughtful execution, calm, under fire. I always talk about the story in London when um, Runny Ray left the records in Ireland. It was a sold out show. It was a matinee because the British people were scared of rappers. Um, <laughs> it was a hot day. The promoter over promoted. You couldn't stick an ace of spades in the audience. And we didn't have the records. So I thought that this was the quickest way that I was going to lose my job and people were gonna get hurt. And then I realized, you know, British people are record collectors. So there had to have been a bunch of people in the audience that had records. So I said, you know, the reason why we're late performing is because we're signing a lot of autographs. And we realized that it's probably unfair and we should prioritize those that brought the record. And a bunch of people raised their hand and, and, and I gathered up the records and that's what we, I said, let's go and, and we perform. Having started on the management side and then eventually working to, to really become a, you know, a record manager. I was a road man manager. A road manager. It's different from a manager. I was on the road for three and a half years. It's the primary everyday resource that I utilize to win. Being on the road with an artist, going through three and a half years of touching in a tactile way, fans, radio, media, just creation of, of music during that period, the stress of success, and be present. You know, one of you want to know what's key to success is to also be present, to be actually there. Not thinking about the future or the past. I was actually present. And then from there I became a manager. And I was a better manager for having been a road manager. In that period in the late 80s, you, you amass, you know, clientele, basically everyone that matters in hip hop, from De La Soul to Public Enemy. How did you transition from being, from this, you know, putting together this, this management consortium mm -hmm. to then working on the label side at Def Jam? Rick left really early on. So Rush Management was doing great, but Rick left. So, you know, we had to continue going forward. So, you know, necessity is a motherfucker. That's a fact. So it wasn't if it wasn't something that I chose. It was something that happened. 
And that's part of being flexible and going with the flow. We recognized at that time what an opportunity Def Jam was. What Def Jam was, was our ability to utilize our influence in the management community. So we had an outlet that we didn't have to go to someone else to ask them to listen to our demo. Were you aware that your skill set was kind of shifting from being the guy that can be on the ground advancing a show, mm -hmm. doing those kinds of things, to all of a sudden, you know, now you're sort of curating a brand and a, and, and a brand identity? I didn't want to be the person who fucked up Def Jam. You know, it, it was a very scary period. And by the way, I had a very I also had a very cold period. I couldn't sign a good artist, and I acted desperately. And it was a, um, there was a period that I was in deep question about my abilities. I was very uh, um, um, confused and, and didn't have the confidence that I needed to be successful at that point. I remember one day I just got quiet and closed the door and I tried to understand what is it about me that is losing personal confidence that is making desperate moves and where is the light going to come from that is going to help guide me and then I realized it was the Def Jam logo. And I brought everybody together and I said, our light will be the logo. It will shine the light on exactly who we sign, how we market and promote that artist. And uh, that's when Redman appeared. And that was a very powerful moment for us because Redman is Def Jam. And that was the the moment that things started changing for us. After finding his sea legs as an executive, Lior began to lead Def Jam and the music industry into an entirely new era. As I remember Russell came to me and complained and said, Vibe doesn't want to put me on the cover. You know, Death Row and, 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 and Bad Boy, Puffy and, and, and Shug, they get covers left and right and center. Why don't they want to put a, me on the cover? And I said to Russell that we've just decided to take a different road than them. We're the AMCO of this. We get into our blue overalls and we drop transmissions. We help artists come in and help them and have them go out. We're gonna represent the highest service work that an artist or an entrepreneur could tap into. It was that decision that allowed Rockefeller to feel comfortable working with Def Jam or Murder Inc. or any of the other companies because we weren't trying to steal shine or be the one we just wanted to do our job that we could feel proud of, that we've contributed to and, um, and made a difference. You also really sort of developed, for the first time since the late 80s, a brand identity for, for Def Jam. There was a club in New York called the Red Parrot. You ever heard of it? I have not heard of it. A very, very critical club. All the gangsters showed up to this club. And a lot of the gangsters would always like be very loud, like I am that guy, but one. And that guy used to come full length mink um, um, coat and then sit very quietly in the corner. And The fact that he was quiet, the whole club would go, yo, that's Fat Cat. 
So I realized very early on that I didn't need Def Jam to be on the back of a Rockefeller record. Everybody would end up knowing. And that, shh, yo, you know that's Def Jam too, right? Is much more powerful than saying, <clears throat> so subtlety, I learned from that moment and that's what that era that you're talking about, Def Jam, Def Jam and the powerful branding, actually was the Def Jam in the most subtle phase. In, in 1998, you guys sold the label to UMG. How did you feel about that emotionally? Um, I fought it like there was no tomorrow. So Russell had already been spending the money and I fought it and didn't want to sell. Now, here's how funny thing about life, okay? They forced me to sell at the highest month in the history of the music business. <laughs> and if it was up to me, I would have rid it all the way down. How many years since 1999 has it been? Yeah. 18, 19 years, all the way down. It's only now starting to bounce. Crazy, right? That's, you know, that's a lot of luck involved in all of this stuff. When you take over the Warner system, how did you think about that challenge when you stepped into that, that chair? Warner was the smallest of the three, Universal and Sony. So I said to myself, having analyzed the whole company, that they have really lost their way humongous bloated rosters and very poor results. So I went through a lot of painstaking focused effort with the a &R staff. I want you to find a roster that you want to engage deeply with. So the only problem with that is that if you're going to cut the roster and you're going to shorten your release schedule, not have so many releases, you have to increase your batting average and break more artists. But those that break need to um, yield more. And that's where 360 came from. A 360 deal, just for those that aren't familiar, basically the, the label assumes piece of the revenue from all yes. sort of revenue streams yeah. around mm -hmm. an artist? Okay. Yeah. And so we went to work and, and started cutting our roster, um, being more focused, engaging more in artist development, not just throwing records at the board and hoping that they would stick, having real engaged, deeper commitment. And, you know, it took some time and it started working. After your time at Warner, you went and dabbled in management again, working with Kanye for a little bit, working with Travis Scott. Having been on both sides of the fence, do you still feel like the 360 makes sense in the new music era? Um, 360 absolutely makes sense. The, the trade-off for an artist is that you don't need to hit on the first record. You could develop your career, because we're aligned. In the long-term success. In the long-term success. Okay. So, and that's the signature that I wanted to, to leave at the Warner Music Group. While you set but up 300? The concept of 300 happened because, first of all, I'm prepared to eat myself and reinvent myself. And 300, was a contrarian bet. They were, everybody in the industry was laughing at me like hyenas. Why like, is that? Like, who, who does he, what, what, is, what is he doing? Hasn't he seen all the charts? Recorded music falling off a map, 18 years of decline. The nerve of people to think that the music business was not gonna survive. Music is an essential element. There's a lot of water out there, but the water industry still works. And my belief 
is we're entering the golden age era of the music industry, but it will never get activated until the empresario comes back. Empresarios are the unemployables, <laughs> but have such a unique point of view of pop culture. We've got an industry right now that's littered with career employees. And we have an uh, industry that is set to explode because of streaming and advertising. I'm hoping that 300, the reason why 300 was, one is because I saw the explosion about to happen, and two is I wanted to ring the bell for capital to team up with the empresario and to build the, the new version of Island Records, the new version of Atlantic Records, the new version of a &M. And to ring the bell that empresarios, it's time. Lior's compass led him back to the label business, but it wouldn't last long. Where others saw a job, he saw a higher calling. You've put a lot of emphasis on the long-term development of artists, yes. in, particularly in the last 10 years. But it seems like as, as an industry, there's sort of a schism in, in the thinking or the philosophy. And you have some labels signing people like the Catch Me Outside girl or Cardi B, who may have more than one hit or may not. But then you also have these people like Chance, where people are trying to build a very long, stable career. Mm -hmm. Do you think that both roads will end in the same sort of promised land? You know, I don't think there's one size that fits all. I think that labels and, and the creative community uh, has the ability to buckle down, take the long road, develop a career, or um, take the very fast fuse. It, it, I, I don't want to be arrogant that there's only one path. There's numerous paths, and that's what's such a, uh, so interesting about uh, the opportunity here, that, that um, uh, the digital revolution has offered. And you refer to the empresarios as the unemployable, yet you currently work at YouTube Music as an employee of this very unusual stream. choice. Yes, how, do, how does for that for them? For right? both of you, perhaps. Right, for both of us, perhaps. So listen, um, this is how I want to explain it. I had no interest in this job, but I do have an interest in being helpful to our industry. And this is one of the most prestigious and powerful companies in the world that have had, I think, a fundamental misunderstanding with the creative industry. That I think that by virtue of me being there can help shepherd, one, a basis of understanding, and two, a basis of building a business together with the creative community that we could all be proud of. You've had to lead a lot of teams over the course of your career. Sure. And fairly large ones. Mm -hmm. When you're sitting with someone interviewing them, how do you know when they're the right fit for your organization? I like f people who want to win because it's in their DNA to win, that they actually want to win and they want to win with others. They don't want to win in isolation. The other thing that's been critical and the most important thing throughout my career is hiring and surrounding myself with people that are significantly better than myself and being okay with it. And giving them the rock and letting them make their own mistakes and being there for them when they're going through their moments of reflection to post-mortem and, and walk them through it. You know, o over the course of the years, you've dealt with a lot of artists with a whole sort of 
vast variety of personalities. Sure. Some introverts, some extroverts. Yeah. Some people who are self-destructive, some people who are very maniacally focused. Yes. What is the key to coaching the best out of an artist? Truthfulness. Like when I see an artist with a, a cup of obvious lean, I'm truthful. I said, that's liquid heroin. You're physically addicted to that, you know? So I'm not a yes person. I'm very direct. You know, it comes back to, I believe that my voice and my influence and I, I could impact the world. A tough philosophy because I'm all in. I'm not kind of, sort of, I'm, I'm not guarded. I don't protect myself. My only protection is when I get um, hurt. I always blame the persona, not the person. Rico is a beautiful person. That fucking Flavor Flav didn't show up to that show. Rico is more responsible. He would have been there because of the struggles of being popular or being an artist and everything like that and the pressures that they go through. Some can handle it well and some don't handle it very well. And so I blame the persona, not the person. You know, you talked about that, that feeling in the pit of your stomach from the failure of the Houdini show. I still feel it. Have there been other moments? Oh, yes. What, what are the most notable ones that, that still sort of haunt you? Well, when I... When Def Jam was in its darkest days, was that feeling reactivated? It was reactivated as a reminder on many instances. You know, the good news is, is I felt it, but I was able to continue going on. So I recognize it's, it's not about the failure, but what I've learned from the series of failures. You know, I wake up every day, the first thing that I think about is maybe today's the day. I jump into my, my shoes. Maybe today's the day I'm going to bump into someone that's going to change the creative landscape. That's my first thought every day for over 30 years. Today could be the day that I bump into who? That's going to change the whole thing.